The particular work we did inspired me massively. It's called Salamanca 1936. It's a dramatization of an incident in the early part of the Spanish Civil War during when poet, philosopher and author Miguel de Unamuno defied a hostile crowd incited by an inflammatory speech made by the fascist general Milan Estrella, I think is how he's pronounced. The story was published by Louis Portillo in George Orwell's magazine, The Tribune, and consequently biographers of that period have used Louis Portillo's text, and that is basically what we have used for this piece. Peter sent me this text, which had originally come, in fact, from Louis Portillo, who had been in the 30s in the Spanish government, but had to leave to save his life and came to England, his son Michael Portillo, very interested in this whole subject. My name is Michael Portillo, or Michael Portillo. Uh, I used to be a politician in Britain. I'm now a maker of documentaries, uh, mainly for the BBC. Uh, but my locus here today is that I'm also the son of Luis Portillo. Luis Portillo was an academic in Salamanca in the 1930s, one of the people who very much objected to the rebellion of General Franco. By an amazing chance, my father was in Madrid uh, when General Franco launched his military coup on July the 18th, 1936. My father immediately got on a bus from Madrid to go back to Salamanca, to his home, to his job in the university. The bus stops halfway, and there was a bus coming from Salamanca to Madrid that stopped in the same place halfway. Everyone got out to have a coffee and a cigarette. And a lady who was coming from Salamanca to Madrid saw my father and said, why are you going to Salamanca? Do you not know that all night they've been shooting people in the square? If you go to Salamanca, you will be shot. Thanks to that lady, my father's life was saved. He got on her bus and returned to Madrid. And then hearing what people told him, he was able to piece together what happened in October of 1936, when Miguel de Unamuno, the rector of the university, gave what would turn out to be his last lecture. Unamuno spoke up for liberal values, for reason and human dignity against a rising tide of intolerance, xenophobia and bigotry. And I think that is something which we have to face again. Not as severely or as obviously, but it has to be faced. It's about division in society. So when you talk about whether it's topical or not, there's always some division in society. I suppose pundits are saying now that we live in a country at the moment which is having problems with division. Uh, nothing like to the extent of the Spanish Civil War, thank God, which was, which was a, a horrific uh, episode. 
Uh, so it's always, this subject is always topical. But we are talking about a, a day when matters came to a head, when it, it, it's an extreme situation, when extreme opinions were voiced in an extreme situation. Salamanca University are very interested in, the, 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 in this performance that we're, we're uh, doing of this piece. But I have to say that I think, you know, the situation in Spain is still very delicate. In recent times, you know, the demands for independence of Catalonia, the capital of which is Barcelona, uh, has caused ructions within the Spanish state. And I think we are treading on quite delicate political ground in Spain with this piece. Peter's written it tremendously powerfully. It's a wonderful piece of writing. It's quite a complex piece. It's quite dissonant at times. It's incredibly expressive uh, of that political dialogue of the time with the militant viciousness on the one side and the defensive Pacific side on the other. Uh, there's some lighter sections to leaven the bread a little uh, towards the beginning, a couple of speeches by other academics. The chorus, who are the bystanders in the scene, play an integral part. Uh, they're, they're buzzing. The split in the Spanish society at that time runs through, through the middle of them as well. The first music of Peter Coppolis that I sang was a piece called The Midnight Skaters, a poem by Edmund Blunden, which was a sort of an analogy for what was happening around the First World War. Uh, and it was a number of years ago now, perhaps well, several years ago since we did those performances. And uh, it was a beautifully written piece and I loved singing it. And so when Peter came up with a, an idea for an, another project, which is this project, Salamanca, uh, I was very interested. My initial ideas for the project date back to 2007. I was reading Anthony Beaver's History of the Spanish Civil War and I came across a passage that particularly struck me describing the confrontation between Miguel de Unamuno and General Mian Ashtray at the University of Salamanca. And I immediately saw what I thought to be its dramatic potential. I uh, sent a copy of this to John Tomlinson, who had been associated with some of my work before, and was very gratified that he was enthusiastic about this, and did a rough adaptation of this for a solo singer. Yes, you will win because you know how to use brute force. The process of learning it was really interesting in that the musical language is challenging, there's no question about that, but living with it and working together with the great John Tomlinson, we all simultaneously learned so much as we progressed and the end product was really very powerful. Many musicians in the audience expressed amazement at the power and depth of the music and some even suggested that it should become mainstream repertoire. So in that sense, I feel we've really done something wonderful and Peter Koplik wrote a great piece. To create this project, I wanted also for it to be a model 
for future ways of working in collaboration and with innovative ideas. It can be viewed as a model for future work involving young people, families, audiences and education decision makers by showing a model of mentoring, collaboration and a chance to work with a wider group including highly trained professional musicians. It was great working with students and staff at Trinity Laban where I also happened to teach because the rehearsal week was scheduled to coincide with an innovative and outward looking program at the Conservatoire which is simply called Colab. Every February, a thousand students get together in 85 projects and uh, turn the place upside down in um, a student-led, staff-led um, exploration of their art and um, challenging preconceptions of what we mean by making music. Kind of different um, from the traditional conservatoire model of teaching, uh, students are they take an idea, they, they're encouraged to explore it in different ways, to uh, take inspiration from dance, literature, art, popular music, music from around the world, uh, music inspired by a theme, people do research around a subject, literally anything's possible. We have everything from an Afrobeat project celebrating the music of Fela Kuti. Um, I've just seen a popular music vocal group and uh, 18th century style improvisation ensemble. Really nothing is out of bounds during Colab. Um, what's really interesting about the Brighton Youth Orchestra Trinity collaboration with John Tomlinson uh, around Peter Copley's work is that it's bringing younger people together, uh, new people who, haven't, people who haven't worked together before, make friends, play music, and also they are mentored along the way by uh, Trinity Laban students. So I've got a girl, she's in her first year I think. Um, she's been really, really helpful, especially with like intonation and rhythm. But um, I th it's been hugely beneficial for me to have her there. And we have had a cellist. I think she's in her third year. And what's really funny is that like, she just sort of pays with everyone and I'll be, I'll be sort of just noodling around on something. And she just goes, right. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> so it's just been really helpful just to sort of little things. A prompt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Because they're not sort of ordering you around, they're just sort of guiding. Yeah, exactly. I've been very fortunate. I came from a Lancashire working class background. Certainly my parents and grandparents were from a very working class background. Uh, lots of singing, lots of music making. So I'm very aware of that background that I have. You know, the brass bands, the Methodist choirs, the, the chapel singing, the, 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 those wonderful hymn tunes, Handel oratorios. And so that's where all my singing came from. That's why I sing. I sing because I was born into that society. Singing was a natural thing. I sang my head off for the first 15 years of my life, and that's probably why I ended up with quite a vigorous, muscular sort of voice. Uh, and so I'm aware that all young musicians coming up need the input. You know, they need to work hard, but they also need the inspiration. They need encouragement. They need experience, and so it's vital for all young musicians to have experiences like this very one that we are having in preparing this piece. So that's a major reason for me being involved. There's a great atmosphere in these rehearsals. Uh, as I said, it's difficult music. You know, this is not easy. It's hard work. You know, have to concentrate like crazy in these rehearsals to to not only get it right, but uh, as I know from my previous concerts with the Brighton Youth Orchestra, uh, you know, they have a wonderful way of building up 
to the performance. They work very diligently and at the end of the day, they really come up with the goods. And they, they, I'm sure they'll play brilliantly uh, when we do these performances. Over the years since I've been the director, many times members of the audience have come up to me and said after a performance, what a shame it is that you have to use the word youth. Why does it have to be attached to the name? And I ask why, and they explain that the word youth for a large majority of people speaks of having to make allowances and perhaps not really playing challenging music properly. And I just feel that that is intrinsically wrong. Young people will achieve wonders if you respect them and ask for a lot. The Brighton Youth Orchestra and myself go back a very long way. I was uh, a member of the Brighton Youth Orchestra in, uh, from about 1978 and I played with them till about 1982. Thereafter, I intermittently returned either as a visiting coach for the cello section or later on I gave occasional compositional workshops with members of the orchestra and the orchestra played pieces by me, in some of which were commissioned, such as my setting of Edmund Blunden's The Midnight Skaters, which was the previous piece that John Thompson performed by me with the orchestra. But there's a more recent connection in that my daughter has been playing in the cello section now for three years and for this project is leading the cellos and I'm very proud that we should be working on a premiere together. I've actually played quite a few pieces with my dad's so um, I really like, I just really like his music and his style of how he writes and his use of harmony and dramatisation because he's sort of he comes across as a very meek person in some ways, but then his music is so Extreme. like, ex yeah, the man of extremes, yeah. It's just, um, it's just really interesting as well. And also have him sitting on rehearsals and be able to see how he is thinking when other people are playing and how he wants things to be expressed. And it's just, yeah, just a lot of fun having a car ride home and then just talking about specific <laughs> things about the piece. I'm like, I really like that chord you used. I really like that. And he's like, well, it's dominant prolongation. <laughs> so, yeah. What I particularly want to see is uh, John Tomlinson, Andrew Show, Peter Copley, the orchestra, the choir, go to Salamanca, to the place where these events first occurred. The ceremonial hall is called the Palanimfo. It is a spectacular room, and it's only appropriate that these words should now be sung, that this music should now be played, that the chorus should be heard in the place where Una Muno spoke these extraordinary words back in 1936. And the extraordinary thing is, that although Uno Muno at the time in 1936 was ostracized for his words, today, decades later, the University of Salamanca would welcome this performance. It would love Uno Muno to return to the university in this form for his words to be heard again. <laughs>